Hello everyone. This is Eric, and I'm going to be streaming a preview of the Distant Worlds 2 Discovery update and the upcoming Kwame no and Gazurian DLC, which will be the second DLC for Distant Worlds 2. I appreciate everyone who has showed up today, uh, who is interested in Distant Worlds 2. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a a big rundown on sort of where we're at, what we've been doing, uh, and where we're going. And I'll try to pay a little more attention to the chat this time than I've been able to in the past. So hello, uh, Kevin, hey Cyclops, hey Das, and hey Max. Um, all right, so let's get started. I know you've all seen this image before, and it sounds like you all can hear me. So I'm going to show you something you maybe haven't seen so much before, and I think Max is posting in the chat uh, some links to the upcoming DLC. But I want to talk about not just the DLC, but what's coming in the base game for people who are just getting the free updates for months. So let me show you all this. So this is one of our illustrations for what's called an Ancient Guardian Vault, and I expect a lot of you will have played this in Worlds 1 before, but a lot of you may not have. Um, so the Ancient Guardian Vaults are coming to the base game uh, in this next Discovery Update. They're free content. Um, they are also going to be tied in to the new Kwamino faction uh, in the DLC. And the Ancient Guardian Vaults, every time you generate a galaxy, there's going to be a pool of possible vaults, each with um, a unique artifact uh, to find within. Uh, that are going to be populated throughout the galaxy. So you won't have quite the same set of vaults each time, but each vault acts as an all-research location. It can unlock a, a research bonus for that, uh, also for a new research area called Ancient Knowledge. And in order to open these vaults, you have to complete some uh, projects in this Ancient Knowledge tree. And when you complete the right one, you unlock the vault and you get the artifact. Um, these artifacts give you a range of empire-wide bonuses, which should help a lot uh, if you find more of these vaults. The Kwame now are going to have a little bit of a leg up on the chase for the vaults, but anyone can find them and open them and, and get the benefits. Um, next thing I'm just going to briefly mention when it comes to free content uh, in the Discovery Update, we have expanded the pirates a bit. We revisited some of their game logic to make them a little bit better at um, how they behave and how they grow over time. Uh, so they're going to be over time building a few more ships. They also have a little bit more uh, variety in terms of the type of pirate faction. So you may recall in Distant Worlds 1 when we got to the point where we had our fully expanded pirates and we're not there yet for Distant Worlds 2, but we had sort of three different kinds. We had smugglers, mercenaries, and raiders going in order from those who were the most peaceful to those who were the most hostile. And we've changed sort of that initial encounter value with pirates now to give you a bit more variety there. So not all pirate factions, when you meet them, will automatically offer you a protection treaty now. Some of them, you might have to give them some gifts and butter them up a bit to convince them to give you protection. Others may never be willing to give you protection, uh, and you may have to fight them uh, in order to get them to, uh, to keep them away from your stuff. But the pirates also now get a pirate cruiser. So that's a new ship model that we've put into the game, which they didn't have before. They topped out of the destro destroyers before. If you attack a pirate base now, they will bring out their cruiser. And if they get strong enough on their own, um, they will be able to actually build cruisers. And obviously, as you ramp up the difficulty settings, so if you set in your galaxy set up the pirates to be very strong in a lot of them, then they might even start with cruisers. If you weaken the pirates, then they're not going to be as strong, and they're not going to be getting to the point where they're building cruisers. Um, but then there is probably the most exciting part here, which is the hive. And I'm just going through some representative illustrations here. Now, the hive are tied in quite closely with the story of the Gazurians, who are the other new faction coming out in the new DLC. But the base game, again, always had what we called the hive carrier but we got pretty consistent feedback from people saying that it was too binary a threat. We had some pretty, pretty simple conditions on uh, finding these hive carriers that were dormant in various points in the galaxy, 
and what would cause them to wake up and how they would behave. And what we generally found from players was that we couldn't quite get it right in that they would either wake up too early and then they were just a devastating, overwhelming threat that couldn't really be countered, or they would wake up too late and then they were sort of trivial, or I mean, once in a while, maybe it was in between, and that was good. But getting into that Goldilocks zone was hard. So we did a, we did several things here. First off, we've expanded the type of hive ships. So you now have smaller hive ships going down to frigates. And we've changed how the hive is spread throughout the galaxy, and we've greatly changed the conditions in which the hive awakes. So what will happen now is when the hive is encountered, uh, if you are, if they sense, because they are basically dormant, because they had depopulated the galaxy pretty significantly when they were last awake, when they sense, you know, someone nearby, they're going to kind of evaluate if there's enough indication that this is an advanced enough civilization, that there's probably a lot uh, going on in the galaxy again. And if so, they'll start the process of waking up. But the smaller ships will wake up first, then gradually the larger ships, and finally the big hive carrier at the end. And as they wake up, they now actually have fleet logic. They will band together in fleets. And they will start out by attacking the pirates. And the pirates are their sort of ancient enemies. If you follow the storyline a bit, um, you've probably gotten an inkling of that. And so we have uh, a bit more of that now in the Discovery Update. And if you know the pirates and the hives attacking the pirates, you also will have an option to help the pirates should you wish. Same thing will happen when they start attacking nearby empires. So those give you opportunities to change your relationships with some of these pirates and empires and perhaps end up with pirates joining you wholesale or other empires becoming more friendly with you if you choose to help them or a little upset with you if you don't. Um, but these hive fleets will now, once they have taken out the pirates in their area, they'll start to raid bases and then they'll start to raid homeworlds. And if you know anything about the hive, is once they get to starting to raid colonies and homeworlds, they don't leave much behind. So uh, prepare yourselves. Uh, but they should now be a scaling threat that shouldn't show up before you're about tech level 2.5 and that it should take a number of years for them to fully wake up once they've been found and a bit longer for them to actually gather in these large fleets and start becoming a problem. So they should now be a credible mid-game threat, a real mid-game threat, um, and one that when they show up are not too overwhelming and not too weak. So that's what we're hoping for. Um, with the hive. Now I'm going to uh, open up uh, the game a bit and we're going to talk through a few other things about the update before I get into the DLC. Okay, so let me uh, switch this off. Now you should see me in the game. So hello again everyone. Uh, and I've got about a 15 page change list for the discovery update. This is the first official update since the hyperspeed update and I wanted to talk a little bit about what we found from the hyperspeed update and, and why, why we did what we did with the uh, discovery update. So first thing, um, when we did the Aurora update earlier this year, that was our first update that had sort of a big, uh, big upgrade in a lot of areas um, in the engine as well as in other areas, but the hyperspeed update kind of supercharged performance compared to Aurora but we saw that there were still some issues, especially crashes, that were coming as a result of some of the parts of the engine that still weren't working as expected. So for this update, we did another engine upgrade. So we upgraded ourselves to the latest version of our Stride engine that we use, and we fixed some additional issues um, related to some of the Stride crashes and made some other improvements, uh, both in terms of performance and memory management. Things aren't exactly where we think we will end up, um, there are still some problems, especially on lower end systems that we've seen, but this is another step closer to uh, getting to where we want to be from a low level technical standpoint. Um, I think the next update, the next big update after Discovery will once again include a bunch more significant engine improvements. This is more like an Aurora level change uh, with Discovery, whereas I think the next one after that will be more of a hyperspeed level change. Okay, so we're continuing with the crash fixes and performance improvements, but we decided that we wanted to, and I just went through, you know, the Hive and the Pirate and the Ancient Guardian Vault changes, which are new content in the free base game updates, and we decided we just wanted to do something 
tie it into the DLC but not make it exclusive to the DLC to do something to make the base galaxy feel more alive and more interesting and to head again further in the direction of where we had been and with this in the world's universe. So we're hoping that the new hive, the new expanded hive, um, the, ex the expanded but not yet final pirates, and that the uh, ancient guardian vaults will give you some more things to discover and interact with uh, and a better mid-game threat to deal with other than just other empires. Um, we also heard a lot of people talk about wanting to head in a direction of having more AI guidance to be able to guide the automation uh, in ways that don't involve full automation and don't involve full manual. And we've always been very open to that. That's what our policy system is about, to give you options to have automation but guided automation. And we heard very, sa very loudly that people wanted more options to influence the weapons that were chosen uh, for research and that were used on their ships without having to fully manually control research or ship design. And we had had something like that in Distant Worlds 1, and we've added something like that into Distant Worlds 2 now. And we're calling these the weapon research families. So I'm just going to give you an idea here. If we go over to our policy settings and we go over to construction, you'll see down here we now have uh, these preferred weapon families. So we could say preferred close-in weapon family, and we can choose here between beams, blasters, gravitic missiles, railguns, torpedoes, and we can do a second one as well to provide sort of a primary and a secondary preference in each category. And we do that for standoff weapons, intercept weapons, which are your point defense weapons, ion weapons, area weapons, and bombardment weapons. And if you set these, and the factions will come with some presets already defining what they prefer. If you set these, then this will influence two things now. This will influence, first off, what research, cho research choices are made in the research screen. So if you have it set to prefer, let's say, beam weapons for your close-in and your, you know, intercept, then it'll try, the research automation will try to go down the beam tree to get those, rather than going, let's say, down the pulse weapon tree to get those. And if you've set, let's say, you know, torpedoes is your preferred standoff weapon, it'll go down the per torpedo tree rather than the missile tree. So the AI should spread itself less broadly across the weapons and try to focus itself more as long as you've set these policies to where you want it to go. And the second part of this is when you look at the automation for the ship design. So normally, you know, you can design your ships manually but if you just leave the ship design automation on, it will also look at these weapon family preferences in deciding what types of weapons uh, it wants to put on your automated designs. And you may notice here that I am playing as the Kwamino, so this is also a little bit of a Kwamino preview that you're seeing as I go through this. And this is a Kwamino frigate, um, which I've kitted out with some beams and torpedoes and some of their unique bubble shields and their unique Nova Core reactor. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the Kwamino later once I finish going through the update stuff. But so this this type of way of doing, um, you know, research guidance is, is, is the new big thing there. Um, we've also fixed some additional or made some additional improvements, I think, is a better way to say it, uh, in terms of how different sources of research progress uh, are handled uh, and can be gained. Um, and we've added one more very exciting bit, and this, again, is part of the base game now. This is not unique to the DLC, but I would argue that the Kwamino gained the most benefit from it since they are such a strong research faction. They can research faster and farther than anybody else. But in all these cases, you'll notice now where the tech tree used to end here, there are now some additional techs here. And these are what we call repeatable texts. And what these repeatable texts do is every time you research them, you gain a benefit to the tech that they connect to, that they influence. So if we take a look, for example, at uh, the transient singularity at the end of the you know, gravity tech tree, we then have a repeatable tech that increases the blast speed by 5%, a repeatable tech that increases the damage by 5%, and a repeatable tech that increases the blast range by 5%. And you can research each of these multiple times, and each time you research it, it will add up those improvements. So if you researched the area twice, 
it would increase the blast area by 10%. Um, and it'll track here how many times you've researched it. And once you have researched those, then the value of the base you know, component will be updated to reflect the number of repeatable improvements that you have made to it. And so you can see now throughout the research tree, for everyone, again, this is part of the discovery update. So for everyone playing the base game as part of the free update, you're now going to get some of these additional repeatable texts. So again, here, like the zero point energy reactor, which is the final end game reactor, you know, you can now get this, which increases its output uh, by 5%, or this, which increases its storage capacity by 5% each time you research that. So if you want to be line, and if you want to really make uh, some of these texts, if you if you really like one particular tech line and you want to just make it the best that it can be, um, and also not stop when you reach the end of the tech tree, this now allows for that. And for the Kwamino especially, I think who are encouraged uh, to beeline and complete tech trees, I think this gives them a lot of uh, fun options. You know, when you've got more research than you know what to do with, now you know what to do with it. Okay, so that's repeatable text. Um, flip to the next page. So we added some options. I'm going to go back out to the main menu here for a sec. Uh, we added some new options in Galaxy Setup. Um, one thing I should comment on is we did find that after the hyperspeed update where much more was going on in the Galaxy, that as a result of all that activity, memory was being used faster than before. So we have changed some of our uh, recommendations for how much, uh, how many cores, all well, the cores I think stay the same from hyperspeed, but how much RAM you should have for each galaxy size for best results. And if you play in sandbox mode, you should note that if you play forever and ever and ever, it could continue using more memory than this even. But we actually have, for the next round of updates, some improvements in mind to memory management which should push that back down again but for where we are right now we bumped it up a little bit to reflect the latest we've seen um i also wanted to call out this because we've seen oh and i'll show you as we're just passing by now we have the gazurians now we have the kwamino they have their unique governments which we'll go over a bit later but if we go to the last page here we got feedback from people that they wanted more control over how to um, which which of the general story events they wanted on or off in their galaxy so if you look here into the general story events section you can now selectively turn on or off the events that are pre-generated for your home system uh, abandoned ships abandoned bases debris fields gravitic locations or major threats that includes the hive so for example if you wanted to play a game and not have to deal with the hive at all you turn off the major threats and you don't have to deal with the hive if you want to play a game and not have to deal with advanced ships and bases being found then you can turn all these three off and the only thing that will still happen is if you have the race specific story events on which means each faction has its own set of story events for its story if you keep those on, then again, in some cases, those will still generate some of these. They just will be much rarer. If you have these things off and these things off, then you've got basically a clean galaxy where none of the general or faction story stuff is in there. Okay? So that's, that's, those are some new options for you. Um, I'm going to pull this up again. And... Uh, we made some improvements on the ship design side, so we noticed that in a lot of cases uh, all of the various bonuses were not being properly accounted for uh, on the design screens or the details of the design screens. Now they, they do get applied, so you can see here the complete bonuses and how they apply. So we're getting in this case 10% energy savings, 18% maintenance savings, etc. So that's all laid out for you now from every b possible bonus source that exists for that ship. Um, we also fixed, I mean there are a lot of just fixes in here. I'm not going to dwell so much on the fixes just to say that um, as you all report them, we do see all the reports. I know we periodically get questions and let me address that now. Um, you know we periodically get questions that go along the lines of why 
hasn't a particular bug that I reported six months ago been fixed? And the answer to that generally is it's, it's simply a limitation of prioritization and time that we have. We don't have a very big team, so whenever we see reports, we have to prioritize them. And some issues, when we look at them, we see that, okay, this issue we can't really reproduce, we can't figure out what's going on. So that obviously, until we get more information or can reproduce it, it becomes a bit of a lower priority. Or we'll look at an issue and say, okay, we can fix this, but fixing it is a major, major effort. And so it might take a week or two to fully fix this issue, whereas in the same time we might be able to fix 20 other issues that are equally important in terms of their effect on the game, then we're going to err on the side of fixing 20 other issues. So there are some issues that knowingly have been put on the back burner not because we're not aware of them. Uh, and in some cases, they're just areas that we haven't prioritized for work yet. So I think what you see if you play the game is, you know, the game is in pretty good shape. There are still issues to fix, but there are some, we know there are some longstanding issues in some specific areas that we haven't gotten to yet. I just want to let everyone know um, we are a small team, but we are going to be getting to everything that has been reported over time. Um, we did some more work on fleets and fleet behavior. I know that's always a popular area. Um, and we did some more work on troop garrison logic. We found some issues from reports with that where troops were being ungarrisoned too quickly so a world would be conquered. The troops would be ungarrisoned and picked up. The world would rebel too quickly. That's been, that's been resolved. Um, we fixed what's hopefully the last bug that was occasionally causing uh, planets with existing populations like independent colonies or some of the story worlds to have inappropriate suitabilities for the population that was on them. That one, uh, there have been a bunch of issues relating to that that we have fixed over time. This should be the last one, so that should hopefully completely fix that. Um, and we fixed a nasty bug with space combat that we found because of the uh, working on the Kwamino on the bubble shields, which are the shields that have the highest shield resistance of any other shield in the game. Um, where we found that there was a case where high shield resistance could sometimes uh, cause the shield to increase in value when it was hit with a weapon that had a lower damage. So that was a interesting and unexpected bug. Um, we fixed some more uh, weird retrofitting issues. Um, we made some more tweaks and fixes in the diplomacy and reputation area, both in terms of the diplomacy advisor uh, being a little bit more intelligent in terms of making suggestions for gifts and in terms of rep some reputation issues that were still happening. Um, when will we make repeatable tech for race-specific tech? That's a good question. Well, there are many race-specific techs that actually end before the end of the tech tree. So in many cases, that's not actually necessary in the sense that, you know, that's not where the tech tree ends. But we did implement repeatable tech so that we could link them earlier than the end of the tech tree. So for sake of argument, just to pick a simple example here, for sake of argument, if you decide, well, I really like Maxis blasters, I don't even want to impact assault blasters or anything else, I just want to make a better Maxis blaster. Could we do something like that in the future and have some repeatable techs here that just let you keep researching Maxis blasters? Yes, we absolutely could. And I expect that in the long run, um, when we go through um, you know, and revisit some of the factions and when we work on more factions in the future, one of two things will happen. Either we'll add some repeatable tracks a little earlier on where they end, or we'll just extend those to the end of the tech tree fully. Um, it depends. That's one of the things that we're still debating. But yeah, I think in time, those will also benefit. Um, all right, let me show you a few more designs while we're talking. So. Let's take a look at the colony ship for the Mortalin. And actually, let me zoom into one of my worlds while we're talking. That'll give you guys something more fun to look at while I go through the the updates related to the uh, to the discovery update. And before we get into the uh, Gizurian and Kwamino specific stuff, you'll see one thing about the Kwamino is they, they have such good shields, they like to use them in, in places where others might use uh, solid materials, they'll use energy fields in a lot of these places. Um, all right, UI improvements. 
one thing that we did is that uh, we, we noticed that there were cases where people would have events happen, whether they are colony events specific to a particular colony, or they are events that affect your whole empire. And it was sometimes not very easy to see what they were happening. Some of them, if they affected happiness or things like that, you would only really see that they were active by looking at your happiness values or looking at your bonus summary. So what we did instead now is we've made sure that all of them, either if they're colony specific, there will be an icon up here on the colony selection screen, or if they're empire specific, in other words, they apply to the whole empire, then you'll see an icon up here for when they happen. Okay, and it'll stay there and it'll tell you now how long that's going to last. And we'll see that, I think, as we play through things a bit here with the Quamino. We'll see how all that works. Um, we also separated out all the Empire bonuses into their own tab here. So now you've just got a single tab with all the bonuses. And as I mentioned earlier now, the same thing happens in ship designs, that any bonuses for any of these sources, as, as they get all wrapped up in how they apply to the ship, those are all now reported on the ship design screen too, so that you don't have any doubts about what applies or doesn't apply. Um, we added some additional filtering and sorting options for the available components in the design screen. We added some filters to the colony list to show colonies that require terraforming or have reached maximum terraforming level and should have their facility removed to help manage the terraforming facility uh, for large empires with lots of colonies. Um, and bum, bum, bum. I think one big change is for nebulas. Some nebula effects uh, will no longer apply to ships or creatures while they're hyper jumping. So if a ship or a creature is in hyperspace, it won't be affected by um, the damage, you know, coming from the various nebulas and storms. Uh, if they are not in hyperspace, then they can still be affected by those. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit also about the graphical improvements we've made, because as we've been working through these things, we have been expanding the game settings to way beyond what they started at, at release. And I know I've spoken a bit about this in the past. Um, so there are a lot of options here now for, we talked about some of the rendering modes before, and again, we recommend you know, the default DirectX 11, but if you have problems, you know, you can try the other rendering modes. Just remember that there are command lines to switch back if you get stuck in one and can't switch back. You can look at the change list and the FAQs for that. But we also heard from a lot of people, uh, now HDR is kind of a finicky thing. Um, the sound is too quiet. When you say the sound is too quiet, do you mean me talking, or you mean you would like to hear the game sounds more? Uh, I'll wait to hear on that. Um, we heard from a lot of people that HDR, oh, I'm too quiet. Um, let's see, can I fix that? Uh, that's 100, is this any better? I cranked it another 10%. Uh, I don't know if that helps, but this is as loud as I seem to be able to make it. Okay. So one of the things we found was that um, HDR is kind of finicky. By that I mean high dynamic range rendering. And you have to have you know a card and a driver and uh, um, a monitor that all support it for it to work properly. Okay. And we've made some improvements in general as we were looking at the engine. We found issues with how certain things are being rendered. So in general, I think you'll see a visual improvement in terms of how some things look in the discovery update versus previous updates. But we also decided to add these gamma contrast brightness and saturation sliders. So that if you are, if you, if your hardware does support HDR and you're running an HDR and it's still, you know, too dark or doesn't look quite right, that you can use these sliders to adjust it so that for your uh, system, for your card and your monitor, and it ends up looking the way you want it to look. And that's our, that's our solution for that for now. We still have a few other things to look at when it comes to HDR, which will hopefully make it even better in the future, but that should address you know, 90% of the issues people have reported with it. Or you can just run an SDR, which is the default and which, which works fine on all systems. Um, I know we've mentioned this before, but I'll just again point out all the new rendering options, uh, the star field level and opacity options, 
uh, some of the additional controls for music and volume and how th the music changes when the scene changes uh, and so on. So all these things, just keep in mind, there's a lot you can customize in the game settings. Um, the ambient lighting was also improved on the ship design screen. We found that there was a problem with it there. So that's also going to be the ship design screen is going to be a little bit easier to see ships as they would look in the galaxy now. Um, we made some improvements also in some cases where some of these notifications were either coming up too often or where they didn't have show me buttons or the show me buttons for going to the location of the message weren't working. Um, we made some more improvements on how ships and fleets and tankers refuel as we continue to get more reports on corner cases. And at this point, generally what we see are corner cases, but you know, we're always looking for more examples. If you run into a situation where you see a tanker or a fleet doing something really stupid, please save it there, send it to us and we will investigate but that's been improved again. Um, we also had a lot of cases where we were still seeing some issues with how the enemy targets list and how the dangerous locations and threats were evaluated. So we made some improvements to how the strength evaluation is done for those locations and to make sure things that shouldn't be going to them are avoiding them, but we also made some improvements in terms of how the handling those locations in terms of how if you queue an attack on the location how your fleets respond to it and what shows up there and this was something that was especially I think useful in the context of the hive we were finding that the hive wouldn't typically show up on these lists and it should have um, and that's been fixed but in the process of doing that we also found some other issues and some that had been reported before that we hadn't gotten to yet that we were able to improve in terms of how all these things uh, get refreshed, get evaluated, uh, and how your queued orders for automated fleets to investigate or attack them get handled. Um, we, did ha we did find an instance, uh, I'm going to mention a few things relating to game events. So when we look at game events, um, what I mean by that is throughout the galaxy, I'm going to turn on a little cheat mode here for a sec. So throughout the galaxy, you have all these all the stuff that you see represented by text here. These are game events that get placed uh, effectively by the game event system. And some of these are part of the main story or the random generation of the galaxy. Some of these are part of a faction-specific story. And what we found was that there were some bugs going on that were affecting general gameplay that were related to some of these game events. One of those, for example, was a case where there was a particular debris field of ancient ships where you would have um, a very late game Shikturi Firestorm Torpedo, and if you went and explored that field, you would get it. Um, that wasn't meant to be. Once we realized what was going on, that's been, that's been taken out. Um, we also had situations like the Mordekosh battleship, which was meant to stay in a particular location that was going roaming too often, and we made sure that that would be, um, oh, our leader's been to post, that that would be um, sort of anchored to stay closer to where it starts. And those types of things, um, there's a bunch of stuff like that where there were just little things in some of these game and galaxy events that were throwing some things off more than they should have. Uh, we addressed a bunch of those. Um, and a bunch more corner cases about repair and construction and stuff like that. All right, we also expanded some of the conditions within the game events, which might be of interest to modders. And another thing that might be of interest to modders is that we have added in the capability now to do 2D characters. So instead of what we normally have, so we have, for example, our enlightened master, Daria Quendo, who is the leader of our Kwamino civilization, and as you can see, these are automated characters so that if, for example, we go and we say, let's, let's talk to the Ikaro Tranquility, you know, we've got this nice animated Ikaro leader who's talking to us and whose animations reflect his emotions and all that. We understood that that was, you know, uh, a high bar to meet if you just wanted to add in a new faction. So we've added in support for just 2D non-animated images so that if you want to put in a faction, and just have it have a 2D image, not require animations, um, that's fully supported now. And there will be documentation with the discovery update on how to do that. Um, and let's see, uh, we fixed a bunch of issues where 
uh, corner cases where you could get um, sometimes not all ships under construction showing in the construction list or construction yard wait times being improperly calculated um, or canceling construction ship missions, you know, sometimes causing some corner case issues. Uh, we fixed a couple of uh, rare cases where you destroy an empire and it would reappear. Um, or certain things that were queued weren't cleared properly when, when certain events happened that should have cleared them. Um, will we ever see something analogous to Solaris's late game threats? Yes, indeed. Um, like the Shakturi, in fact. That's, I'll talk about that a bit more at the end of the stream after I talk about the Kwamino and the Gazurians, but y the, the Shakturi are next in line. So the Kwamino Gazurian DLC is releasing on September 7th. The Discovery Update is releasing on August 22nd. And the thing that we have already started work on, which will be our main focus after the Kwamino and Gazurian DLC releases, on top of just continuing to do updates for the base game, uh, is the Shakturi. And the Shakturi will be the big uh, sort of first late game, end game threat. You know, the defeat this or it'll wipe out the galaxy level threat. So that's what the Shakturi will be uh, as, uh, as the first sort of proper expansion for Distant Worlds 2. Um, and, you know, depending on how all that goes, I mean, one thing we're doing here is we're experimenting a bit. So we have the Ikaru and the Dayut as a faction DLC with the Kwame no as a faction DLC. We're going to see how those two have done and then decide based on that how much you all like these faction DLCs. And then we're going to do this expansion with the Shakturi, which is a bit of a feature expansion and adds this big late game threat and see how you all like that. And that'll help also inform us as to what we should direct our uh, non-free update development efforts towards in the future. Um, okay, so let's see. What else should I call out here with the update before I get into just playing the game with you all? Um, we talked about the modding support. Uh, fleet and ship behavior. I think all that's been pretty much covered. So I think, I think for the most part, we've hit the highlights of the update. So let me just pause here for a sec. Does anyone have any other questions on the update? And I'll just do a quick wrap up for those that joined us late. Is the update doesn't just improve a lot of areas and fix a lot of bugs that we hadn't fixed yet, but it also adds some new content in the form of ancient guardian vaults that will now be in the base game galaxy, repeatable techs that are added to the end of the tech tree. Um, a much expanded and more scaled hive threat that should now be an appropriate mid-game threat, shouldn't come too early, shouldn't come too late. Um, and some expanded piracy, so that you've got pirates that have a little bit more variation in terms of how they like you, and they can also get pirate cruisers, and they're a little bit more active in terms of how they expand. So, all right. So let me see here. I'm not seeing any questions yet, but I know I'm lagging behind a bit. So I'll give you guys a little bit more time. Locating research locations controlled by the AI used to be difficult to locate. Has that been changed? Well, typically speaking, uh, the main way that you would locate them would be uh, if you're at war with them, you know, to go to the enemy targets and focus on them there. Um, what was your, what was the problem that you were seeing before DAS? Were they not showing up for you on the enemy targets as a possible target, uh, as a possible location controlled by the AI? Um, were you looking to see them somewhere else? Just locating them for planning. I mean, I would say that, you know, it's always possible if you have either sensor range or ships, you know, out and looking around that you go in and look at these uh, particular systems. But what I would expect is that they would show up on the enemy targets list um, once you are at war. Um, we can look into something to make sure those get added as a, uh, even in a non-war situation uh, for planning purposes. Uh, but right now, the way that I would do is I would take a look here. And so if I'm looking here, I can see that there are, you know, all these uh, different stations. So I can see they have a research facility here and the mining stations here. So that gives me an idea of what's in that system. 
you know, I can look over at the system as well. And once I'm in the system view, I see they just have a mining station there. That's that's how I would do it right now, unless I was at war. When I was at war, then I would expect to, to see those as available targets on the enemy targets list. Okay, all right. Sure, give us your, email me or, or post with your suggestion of what how you'd like that to work. Okay, all right, so I haven't seen, uh, right, well, research locations normally is only for your own uh, planning purposes. So you can see like new research location shows me that down here, there's a location with, that's a really nice location. So I can build a research station there, there are my existing ones. But I understand what you're saying is something that, um, yeah, we could add it here too. You know, we could say research stations that you could add a filter that shows you other people's research stations, but it kind of makes sense that it might be a variant of this, um, where we could just basically say, you know, for targets, that for empires that you are not in conflict with, but might be, that you want to see all the locations of theirs that you know of, so that you could plan for the future uh, if you were going to attack them. All right, so no other update questions that I see. Um, are undeveloped versions of independence that are already in the DLC still in the game, like the undeveloped, limited, Kwamino, etc.? If no, why not? Um, undeveloped originally versions of independence. Um, I'm not sure what undeveloped, limited, Kwamino is. There are still Kwamino independence in the game, so you know, they'll just be based on the fully finished, flushed out Kwamino now, but independents themselves are quite limited. So when you run into an independent, they don't have all the capabilities that an empire of that faction has, or that species has, but they do have the basic traits. And if you assimilate them into your empire, or conquer them into your empire with enough of a population, then you get a prorated benefit of their traits. So for example, if you brought this Tekan independent into your empire, you would get a prorated bonus of mining rate, damage control, repair rate, trade income, ship construction speed just by having all those uh, Tekans in your empire. And you can bring them in again through colonization, assimilization, assimilation, conquest, migration, many ways to get other species to be in your empire. Um, and having a faction sort of I guess that's what you mean. So f a fully developed faction like when the Kwamino or the Ikaro or whatever the mortal in the base game become fully developed. It doesn't prevent them from being independents. Um, it just means that they no longer have the old sort of placeholder, distant worlds one art. Otherwise, they work the same as independents. Um, all right. So let's talk a bit about uh, the factions themselves, because I know a lot of you are here to hear a bit more of a preview of the DLC. I'm gonna I'm gonna save this and hop back out for a bit to the main menu so I can go over these with you. So we have two new factions, the Kwamino and the Gazurians. And if you haven't already taken a look, you should look at the store page for those because those give a, also a very good summary of what's unique about them. But we'll start out with the Gazurians because we've been looking at the Kwamino. So we have two, these are two pretty specialized factions. Um, the Gazurians are kind of a force of nature. They are the fastest growing species in the galaxy. There's not going to be anyone who grows faster than them. Um, they prefer living on uh, desert planets, uh, though they can live on some other places. They are overall aggressive, though they're not sort of deviously evil in the same way as perhaps the Bascara or uh, deceptive in the way that the Dayut might be. They are usually quite upfront about the fact that they simply you know, need to consume more, they need, and, and you're in the way. And so they're going to eat you and make more Gazurians. Um, and it's just a sort of normal thing to them, just like it might be if you ate a, a burger or something like that, or, or picked a piece of corn. That's sort of how they look at uh, some of the other species in the galaxy as, as, for the most part, things that can be consumed to feed the growing Gazurian hordes. So let's talk through some of their bonuses and some of their special abilities uh, because a lot of these um, bonuses relate to their playstyle, and I think if you're playing them thematically, you can get them into a sort of hyper growth mode 
But let's start out just looking through some of the values, and then we'll talk about some of the special features and, and conditional events that they have. So first off, they start out with a significant penalty to research and a penalty to diplomacy. They're not particularly interested in either of those. Um, they don't tend to get weary of war very quickly. They're, as, as you can tell by looking at them, they also have innate flight. They're good at you know, boarding combat. They're generally good at ground combat. Um, what they do have is they have a talent for reverse engineering things. Uh, and that talent comes from the fact that when they take something, they take it apart to the tiniest bit and piece. And even though they might not be innately as intelligent as some of the other factions, or at least as interested in, in science or research per se, they are really good because they disassemble things so thoroughly at sort of understanding how something was put together. So as a result of that, um, they do get some benefits to repairing things, to maintaining things. Uh, they have far fewer ambassadors and fewer scientists than others, but more admirals and many more generals. And we'll talk through now some of these special events. So waste nothing means that when you're salvaging or retiring a ship with more advanced technology than you, then you get an increased chance of tech boost. So as they, as you, let's say, take someone else's ship or find an abandoned ship, if you retire it, as you're retiring it or as you're uh, repairing it, you're going to have an increased chance that you will get little research boosts through that process as they figure things out. And if you completely retire it, scrap it, there's a chance that you'll get an additional tech boost at the end. They have this ability called the scouring. So if you conquer an enemy colony, you can scour it. And if you scour it, then immediately 10% of the population on that world is consumed. They're basically exterminated. Um, and it makes that world unhappy, damages your reputation, and reduces that world's development to its baseline. So why would you do it? And the reason you would do it is you get, normally if you conquer a world, world you get one tech uh, chosen from what that empire world might have access to that gives you a boost tech-wise. Um, this time with the scouring you get two, and you get a bunch of resources that you wouldn't otherwise get in exchange for devastating the world's development. But probably most importantly, it gives you a boost to population growth for Gazurians throughout your entire empire. Uh, before this discovery update and this DLC, we couldn't actually do population growth boost at this level of resolution, but now we can. So if the Gazurians scour a planet, they will get an empire-wide population growth boost, and that comes on top of them already having a very high population growth rate. And I'm just going to skip rivalries for a second talk about Breeding World, which is that if you take an empire in your, uh, sorry, a planet in your empire that does not have Gazurians, and you decide to set any non-Gazurians on that planet to exterminate as a population policy, that turns it into a Breeding World and triggers the Breeding World event. And while the Breeding World event is ongoing, while those uh, other people on the planet are being exterminated, you get a cumulative uh, bonus per breeding world, again, to your population growth for Gazurians in your entire empire. So if you get on a bit of a roll, and I can't, in my testing, I haven't been able to do this all the time, but when I'm, you know, expanding and conquering, I can maintain this for significant periods of time. Um, and you have a combination of breeding world and scouring going, you can get into some pretty crazy uh, empire-wide growth rates. Um, Obviously, you want to also have worlds that have sufficient room for those growth rates to make a difference, too. And then there's this rivalries event. So Gazurians are known for also having these tribal internecine conflicts among themselves. So one of the downsides to playing Gazurians, though it also has a silver lining, is that periodically two of your characters will have a rivalry. And when they have a rivalry, you will have to choose which of the two characters will win that power struggle. The other one will die will be killed. The one that survives will get improvements to their skills and traits. But you are going to lose a character periodically due to these rivalries. Um, we also get uh, these tribal conflicts that can happen that can make the Gazurians lose some uh, happiness, but again can, can give them some other boosts. Um, and we have a couple of other unique things here. So uh, Swarm Command is something that is a special uh, component that the Gazurians get. Um, you can see it all, you should be able to see it also listed down here. It's called Swarm Targeting. 
So they have a special targeting component that gives them a fleet targeting bonus, and they can get this quite early. I'll show you this in a bit. For every ship in the fleet. So they also tend to favor, once they get that research done, they tend to favor making very large fleets. So the Gazurian Swarm is a real thing. They will arrive as a swarm, they will scour your world, they will devour you, and they will move on. And then we have uh, some unique leader traits for them. I don't think I need to go into those in great detail, but we'll talk through some of the other unique things. They also have unique hangers. So yeah, we've, we've actually been expanding the unique features. So as we do each faction, uh, we've been listening to the feedback and we got a lot of positive feedback about the Akura and the Dayut, but we had some feedback saying, you know, go a little farther even. Um, I'll talk about that a bit more as I go through the Kwamino features. You know, go a little farther even. And so we tried to go a little farther with the Gazurians and the Kwamino. Uh, so the Hive Hangers, so what do they get? They have a special sub-branch of the Fighter Tree. And it's not so much that they get better fighters than anyone else, but they have hangers that they can get uh, for less research earlier, uh, including planetary hangers. So you can get a hive fighter base on your planets at like tech level one. I mean, like two tech levels before anyone else who normally can build a planetary fighter defense base. And your hangers and your fighter bases repair and recover fighters faster than others. So overall, they're going to have, um, you know, a lot more fighters that they can pump out over time once they're in combat, and they can regenerate fighters in between combats faster. Uh, and the last unique thing for them is what's called hex armor. And what is hex armor? It's r it's on the surface not that different from your normal armor. Its rating is slightly higher, but it's only size eight instead of size ten which can make a big difference in terms of what they can do in their designs. So the combination of it being size 8 instead of 10, as standard armors are, and the fact that it has a slightly higher rating, uh, armor strength, um, uh, makes it sort of a pretty unique choice for them. Uh, and their victory conditions, they're, they have fairly warlike victory conditions, as you can see here. And they have a unique government called the Cell Hegemony. Uh, and the unique this is sort of tied into their story, and I don't want to spoil much, but the Cell Hegemony is like a limited hive mind. It's not a full hive mind. Um, it allows them, they have some ability to have a shared consciousness with other Gazurians that are nearby, but they don't have the ability to have a full hive mind uh, throughout their whole empire by default. Now I will say, we made this decision because of the Gazurian backstory and how that ties into the hive, and if you play through the Gazurians, you will understand that, and there is a story way to get a full hive mind too, but we also decided to add this in the galaxy setup. So if you don't like the idea of your Gazarians not being a full hive mind from the beginning, they start as either cell hegemony, feudalism, or republic from the beginning, you can switch to allow any, and then you can have you know the hive mind right from the start instead of just the ones that are allowed by default by race. Okay? Um, and the cell hegemony here, I should talk about a couple of unique things with it. It's got, uh, as you can see, the array of bonuses and penalties that it has. It reduces, it, it uses luxuries at a 25% reduced rate compared to if you have a cell hegemony, your people will consume luxury resources at 25% less than normal. And it has a greater chance of creating ins characters with inspiring presence and a lesser chance of creating demoralizing characters. And this is sort of reflective of that limited hive mind aspect to them. They get along better than most, but they're still not a full hive mind. And starts with exploration scanners, improved sensors, and uh, coordinated control for command systems. All right, so I'm going to hop into the Kwamino next, but let me just pause for a sec. Any other questions about the Gazurians without going, you know, into starting a game with them yet? Any other questions about them or their abilities or bonuses for any Gazurian fans? Uh, thank you. I'm glad the DLC are unique and interesting. And it is going to be a tall order to, to upgrade the base factions, but I'm sure we can do it. Um, yeah, we are going to be starting with the humans soon on that uh, to do an upgrade of them. The only real cap on bonuses from swarm targeting uh, depends on how many ships you can afford to put in your fleet. So it's more it's more based on your economy uh, than anything else. 
Now there is, I will say, there is a calculation in the game, um, so that there is a, there is no 100% you hit, 100% you miss. So, but you can with swarm targeting, you can get up to that cap of all my shots. So I'm going to get up basically to the cap of everything being as accurate as it could possibly be. And obviously, your enemies will have countermeasures, things that detract from targeting. So the more swarm targeting you have, the better you'll be able to deal with enemies who have invested into, into countermeasures. All right, so let's hop over. Uh, are the, f the fighters are not counted in the fleet size, sorry. <laughs> that, would be, that would be a bit too much. Um, ships only uh, can have this component. All right, let's hop over to the Kwamino. So the Kwamino are sort of the galaxy's greatest introverts. Uh, is what I usually refer to them as. They really would love if they were just kind of left alone to focus on their research and their exploration of the mysteries and puzzles of the universe. They love to solve puzzles, but they don't like to be really bothered. Um, they don't like to really be have to deal with too many distractions. So they're a bit they're a bit single minded, but they are they're a peaceful and very research oriented faction. So uh if we look at them we can see they're quite aggressive. I uh, sorry, they're quite passive aggression wise. They're quite careful. They're very dependable. They have a relatively average reproduction rate. Again, remember for the Gazurians this was nine percent. These guys are down at five percent. They don't tend to migrate and they don't tend to assimilate very quickly. They prefer mangrove forests above all, but marshy swamps, ocean worlds, things like that can work for them. Um, and they are, they are unique. There is never going to be another faction, just like there's never going to be a faction that grows faster than the Gazurians, there's never going to be a faction that researches faster than the Kwamino. The Kwamino themselves start with a plus 20% all research bonus, and if you understand how all research works in the game right now, it's very, very powerful. It not only counts for all research categories as far as getting you across any research thresholds of being able to progress down the technology tree. It also increases your research speed and provides bonuses. So it's it's um, it's going to increase your research output. It's going to increase your research speed. It's going to get you across research threshold. It's really a very, very powerful bonus to have. They also are not terribly interested in diplomacy. Um, not very good at espionage, but th their particular specialty, although they are good at all things that require solving scientific puzzles, they have a particular talent for energy, and so in reactor research they're even better, um, which goes along with their unique Nova Core reactors that we'll talk about in a bit. They, they generally will get a take advantage of in trade. Um, again, they're good at energy. Uh, they don't generate many ambassadors, admirals, or generals compared to others, but they generate more scientists than others. And they have a unique government, which we'll talk about a bit, called the Geneocracy. But let's talk through some of these other things here. So alien distractions. Uh, year incentivizes the Kwamino not to get heavily into the diplomacy part of the game. If you look down here, one of your victory conditions is to have the fewest treaties in the galaxy. Okay, so keep that in mind. Because any time that you sign a treaty with another faction, the only exception to this is uh, pirate treaties, uh, but if you're signing a treaty with another faction, it's going to increase your happiness by one empire-wide, but it's going to give you a minus 20% all research penalty for two years. So it's going to basically really distract the Kwamino uh, to have all these, you know, aliens that they suddenly ha have uh, running around or are dealing with. Um, so you have to sort of plan your treaties judicially, and this will stack. So if you try to have try to sign three treaties at once, you'll get plus three happiness and minus 60% all research. They have integration studies, which means that if you have alien populations at your colonies and they are not fully assimilated, then you get a prorated reduction in happiness and research output until they are assimilated. Now, the good news is people assimilate pretty quickly, but let's say that you uh, conquer or colonize another planet and they're not fully assimilated, that's going to, again, distract your society for a bit because the Kwamino have, the way we envision it, is they have a very particular way that their society runs. And when things are not in sync with that, then it, it pretty quickly gets uh, outside of their comfort zone. Um, the Kwamino AI should be uh, less likely to pursue treaties. 
Um, will it be more difficult to get difficult to get them into treaties with you? Based on their modifiers, it should be somewhat more difficult. Um, but I guess I mean, if you wanted to use this against a Kwamino, and if you really wanted to throw a lot of uh, wealth and resources their way to try to get them to be so happy with you that they would sign a treaty. I guess you could force a distraction in that way, but in that case, they'd be, you know, it would be a willing distraction for them. Um, they have. Uh, I'm going to skip the answer for a minute here, and I'm going to skip puzzle solve to talk about these other ones. So whenever they find a new research location, not even build a station, they have a chance of getting a research boost because it's a piece of the puzzle. They're trying to sort of solve the puzzle of the galaxy, of the universe, you know, what it is. Uh, they also get another bonus to happiness when they've built a new research station. Again, this is kind of what they're focused on. And then they have these two traits. So a puzzle solved is one of the things that encourages them to beeline down the trek tree. So when you complete an advanced research project, which we define as tech level two or higher, noting that the pre-warp techs where the tech tree starts are like tech level zero. So counting up from tech level zero all the way on the left on the research tree. So tech level five or greater, you get a chance for each project that you complete that's of those higher levels that you get a significant boost to happiness in all research and an extra positive trait on your scientists and leaders. So when they feel they're getting close to finally figuring out the full answer, the full answer to a particular research tree, as they get further over to on the research tree, they, they start getting more excited, more happy. Uh, more motivated to research further and that can also build up um, and they also get what's called the answer here they have a transcendence hub planetary facility that's unique to them which is basically the Kwamino achieving uh, a singularity of sorts where they no longer rely on their bodies uh, where they can sort of be brains in jars if you will and they can just focus for all eternity on their research and their puzzles and the way that you achieve that is by building the Transcendence Hub. In order to build the Transcendence Hub, you have to complete a few research trees, and it's sort of the capstone project at the end of those. Uh, but this is the answer is an additional boost that they get when they complete that. Um, there are some unique traits they get for their leaders, scientists, uh, and ambassadors. And this is one unique thing about them is they cannot do concurrent research. So they can only research one project at a time. Even if they have a lot of research bases, they focus on one thing at a time. They're not going to do two, three research projects at a time. Um, the Kwamino can work with multiple species on the same planet. In my current game, I found two colonization ships that were ancient ones that were abandoned. I brought them over to colonized planets. The key thing is assimilation. If those other aliens are assimilated to Kwamino culture and society, then it doesn't bother the Kwamino. If they come in unassimilated, then it's going to really distract the Kwamino. And if you're signing treaties with other entire empires, so it's not like part of your own empire, but you're now getting involved with, you know, a human military dictatorship, which is completely alien to how the Kwamino would do their business. That's going to really distract them. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk also about their unique tech. So they get bubble shields, which are like normal shields, except that they have higher shield resistance, which means the flat damage reduction that any shot that hits the shield gets uh, reduced by. They have Nova Core reactors, which are bar none the best reactors in the game. So when it comes to energy efficiency, massive amounts of energy, uh, nobody has a better solution for that than the Kwamino. They get the Enigma Maze, which is a unique facility you can get pretty early on that increases the quality of your leaders and scientists if you build it at your uh, at one of your planets. And they get a Transcendence Hub as an end game facility, which also completes one of their victory conditions and gives them that sort of singularity. So if you build a Transcendence Hub, you have the fewest treaties in the galaxy, the most completed research branches in the galaxy, and you reach the 30% Empire bonus level in Ancient Knowledge, which we'll talk about in a sec, then you've completed all their victory conditions. Their shields are, I would say, uh, well, they're different from the Xenox shields. The Xenox specialize in having very high recharge rate shields. So the Xenox shields are very good at regenerating their strength over time. The Kwamino shields are not as good as the Xenox shields at doing that, but the Kwamino shields are better than the Xenox shields at the flat reduction of incoming damage. So I would say, you know, when you're playing as the Kwamino, you're going to be a lot more resistant to those small weapons, like the ones that fighters carry or the, you know, little extra intercept weapons that ships have that they may fire at your ships. Those are just going to bounce off your shields. 
Um, whereas with the Xenox, they would take that damage and then they would regenerate it. So it's sort of two different ways to, to achieve a similar result. Um, so let's talk about ancient knowledge. So I talked about the fact that the discovery update is going to include these ancient guardian vaults. So these ancient guardian vaults, each of these ancient guardian vault locations include a new uh, research bonus called ancient knowledge. And these particular um, bonuses, the more of these vaults that you research and open, uh, the more of this bonus you'll be able to get. And the Kwamino, for story reasons, that if you play through them, you'll understand better if you play through their story, they are incentivized to pursue and find as many of these ancient vaults and open them as they can to reach as high a bonus in ancient knowledge as possible. Now let's talk for a moment about their uh, unique government type. So the Kwamino have the geneocracy, and the way to think about the geneocracy is if you imagine a government that is like a wartime government that has focused all of its efforts towards a single goal, um, so that you have, you know, uh, you think about like everything else is not really available in abundance, it's sort of rationed so that you can pursue this one goal. This is what the geneocracy is, except it's focused on research. And it's focused on that they have tests that determine who is intelligent enough to rule, right? So their tests are based on things like the Enigma Maze, where you have to solve these puzzles to figure out if you are able to advance in the geneocracy. And um, the in exchange, they get, so they get some penalties, like a little bit reduced colony trade income, mining rates, and troop rates, but they get another plus 20% to all research. So if you're keeping track, the Kwame know themselves have plus 20% all research, a Kwame no geneocracy, that brings up to plus 40% all research. And then if you're researching reactors, that's plus 60% total in the reactor area. So the Kwame no are very, very good at research. Okay. Oh, Kevin is our, uh, yep, Kevin is, is, our, is our art guy. And in fact, Kevin made um, the Kwame no ships. So when you see the Kwame no ships, and if you like them, you can say to Kevin that he did a good job. Um, yes, thank you, Edmund. <laughs> so uh, I am apparently uh, the world's greatest introvert, too. Um, and yet I'm live streaming, so go figure that out. Um, but... One of the things about the Kwame no, how do they get this government with a big uh, all research bonus is they cannot fund colony growth. So the Kwame no will grow slower than just about any other faction in the game, which makes them kind of diametrically opposite to the Gazurians, but they'll advance faster technology wise than any other faction in the game. And there are two other unique abilities that the geneocracy gets that nobody else gets. So if you're running a geneocracy, if you get a crash research either naturally or by paying for it, you can then expend a scientist to immediately complete that project. So let's say for sake of an argument that you're researching Garak's hyperdrives and you either choose to crash the project or one of your scientists has a positive event, uh, ha die roll happen and they naturally get a crash in that project, you can then immediately choose to spend a scientist, your choice which one, and then the project immediately completes. The only thing is you've paid a scientist for that. But over time, you will get more scientists. And if you built your Enigma maze, then the quality of those scientists will improve too. And then what if you get a critical failure? It's a painful thing for a lot of people if you've been researching a big project and you haven't crashed it because crashing protects you from critical research failures, but you've been researching for a while and suddenly you get a critical research failure and it resets it to the beginning. You're like, oh no, I just lost those two, three years I spent researching that. Well, if you're playing a geneocracy, you can pick a fall guy here. Um, what you can do, or just someone who saves the day, however you want to look at it, is if you have a critical research failure, you can immediately expend a scientist and that will cancel the failure and instead immediately crash the project. So the Kwamino have these sort of two, the Kwamino geneocracy specifically has these two special abilities that they can get um, that let them make their research faster and more reliable. Uh, that's the way you can look at it, or maybe they retire. Like, maybe that was their capstone idea. That was their big idea, you know? Like, they finally had their eureka moment, and uh, they made this huge breakthrough, and then that's, you know, the end of their research career. So however you want to look at it in your empire, it's up to you what you decide. Um, all right, so that sort of walks through 
uh, some of those unique things for the Kwame and the Gazurian. So I'll pause for any other, yeah, they get a Nobel Prize basically, whatever the Kwame no version of that is. So, uh, democ and Kwame no can be a democracy, a monarchy, or a geneocracy by default, though again, we now have this option here in the discovery update that lets you allow any government. So let's, um, uh, the DLC is releasing September 7th. The discovery update uh, is releasing on August 22nd. So September 7th for the Kwame no and Gazurian DLC, August 22nd for the update. If there are no further questions on the Kwame no, then let's, let's, let's play a little bit of a game here. This is our Gazurian loading screen. And, oh, I should show you, actually. Let me just do this real quick. Uh, there's a couple of other l nice pieces of art I wanted to show you while we're reviewing this. So let me show you first the Kwame no ship set. So this is an overview of sort of what the different Kwame no ships and stations look like. And um, I'm going to keep this up for a minute here so you all can take a good look. And you can see how they focus on these sort of, uh, you know, circular shapes and how they focus on having these energy fields uh, in the place of some of the um, uh, places where other ship, other species would use, you know, physical materials. All right. And then I'm going to show you the Gazurian ship set. So this will also give you an idea. With the Gazurians, their ships are, you know, a lot of ships for other factions have been either long or wide. These guys are a bit taller than the other factions in terms of how their ships and stations look. Um, and as you saw in the loading screen, which I'll again show you in a minute, um, there is uh, a lot. There are a lot of fighters that come out of some of those hangars for those Gazurian ships. And I'm going to show you. Uh, this is an illustration of the Kwame no ships leaving one of their planets. And this is an illustration of the Gazurian ships. This was the loading screen that we just saw. And they tend to move, as I said before, in a swarm. So that's a Gazurian carrier in the middle. I'm going to also show you uh, a, an illustration of a Gazurian world. So this is what it looks like if you're on a Gazurian planet, at least how we imagine it. And uh, those are the Gazurian hives, basically, on the planet. A lot of their stations look a bit like this, too. And this is what a Kwamino world might look like. Thank you. I also I agree. The art department does a great job for us. Um, we have our art team, our content team, and our development team. Um, I'll be releasing a blog a little bit later on this month that talks about all the uh, different parts of the team that put work into this DLC. And then the last part here that I'll show you, now that you've seen the Kwame no world, is I want to show you the Gazurian and Kwamino leaders, uh, just so you kind of get a quick idea of what they look like. And they look a little better in game when they're animated. But that gives you pretty much an idea of what to expect from them. Now we'll go back to the game. What we are planning to do with the original factions is we are planning to go back one by one and make some improvements to them to make them feel a little bit more up to date with the new DLC factions so that they will get some additional, you know, of these conditional events. They'll get um, probably a couple of additional illustrations each. Um, they'll get some more work done to their bonuses and their governments and things like that to make them feel again, a little bit more unique 
uh, in their own way. Um, we're, we've been starting with the humans on that, but we haven't finished them yet. So I think going through the humans will help us understand uh, the timeline on updating the rest of them. But the, the goal is not, you know, uh, that we will revisit all factions eternally, but that we will just take those initial base uh, game factions and take what we learned from the original release and from the Ikuro Dayu DLC in this one and sort of try to apply some of that backwards to just bring them a little bit more up to the same level. Uh, Alright, so let's play a bit as the Kwame no. And I will just... Uh, I'll stay here uh, as long as I am able to field questions and we can talk through things. So this is a Kwame no game. I've got some Ikuro here, I've got some Xenox here, some Hakanish here, got various kinds of pirates, uh, Independence, Mordlin over here. I've got a few nebulas. Uh, there's a nebula with a Gravitic Storm in between the Mordlin, sort of, which is good. Um, and I've decided that even though I don't really want to um, do too many treaties, I think maybe I will befriend the Ikaro, just to have one faction that's close by that I could trade with. Yeah, we're not planning to redo ship sets or anything like that, though it's possible we may, um, as we revisit the base factions, we may tweak some of the textures uh, to improve them where that's appropriate. Uh, but redoing ship sets would be beyond what we could, what we could reasonably do, what would be feasible for us. Uh, I've got currently these colonies, so I was saying this is my base colony here. And I've built here, I've got my ancient Kwame no repository, a robotic troop foundry, and you'll see a lot of the troops that I have built are battle robot brigades, because the Kwame no would rather focus on research and let robots fight for them. Um, and then we have the Enigma maze, so you can see that here, plus 10% leader quality, plus 20% scientist quality, and it gives me a bonus. That's for my whole empire. Then it gives me a bonus to colony development and happiness for the place where I built it, which was on my capital world. And I've got my administration center. I'm a big believer in those administration centers. I've got another world here that has Kwame no. I've got a world here that has fully assimilated humans. And these came from two ancient colony, colony ships that I found. Uh, I think it was for these. Uh, the Securans were an independent. The humans came from an ancient colony ship I found. And then I've got two more Kwame no worlds. You can see the population is not massive here. Uh, the Kwame no don't grow super quickly. Uh, I did find some ancient guardian vaults. And apologies for this. This is I'm playing on a build that's not the final build, and there's a image missing here. But um, this is one particular artifact that I found uh, related to the ancient guardians which increases ship construction speed through my empire and gives me a plus two bonus to all research. This is another artifact I found, I believe on one of the independents that I colonized. Um, could we have a poll about what races should be in the next DLCs? We do know what will be in the next one after the Shikturi, but beyond that, we haven't made up our minds fully yet. So yeah, I'd be open to putting up some kind of poll like that. Um, and the other thing that we have is on here, we have this ancient puzzle park. That's part of the Kwame no story, so I'm not going to spoil too much of that. But that is giving me a bonus to construction research and some tourism income. So those are sort of my artifacts and my colonies. Um, we have some mining stations. Yeah, I, I did try to get out around the Ikaro here and spread out some mining and research stations in this direction. And when you look at my fleets, I've got my one attack fleet, the space normalization fleet over here, which I've been having work on different threats. So it's working on this threat over here now. Obviously there are some threats like this that I cannot possibly deal with based on their strength, but the smaller ones I've been trying to do something about. Uh, and I've also got two defense fleets, both of which I've been keeping based at my uh, my home, though I think that what I will do is I will take the first defense force and I'm going to move that over to here because uh, that is my closest colony to the Mordlin who I recently ran into. So I'm going to set their home base to there and I'll tell them to go guard this. 
And let's also make sure they do have a spaceport. No, they have a research station. So let's see if we can build a spaceport here yet. Yeah, we can. So I'm going to go ahead and build a spaceport here too, which will help draw more resources to that location. Already the fact that there's a colony there will help, but a colony and a spaceport is basically your maximum draw. And that'll give us something here in between the Mordelin and the Hakanish. I don't really trust the Mordelin or the Hakanish very much. So I'm sure that at some point they will try to come after that colony, are the odds. Um, yeah, that puzzle park, there's a story about that. Um, I really like the humans, human textures personally. Um, we actually did those pretty late on. Um, yeah, I mean, we could, uh, like I said, we'll take a look as we go through the base factions, but we're not planning major art changes. We were looking more at uh, bringing their gameplay a little bit more up to speed. Uh, that puzzle park, there's a bit of a story. Uh, oh, hey, Jim. Yeah, that is a nice book, isn't it? That's Flashpoint Southern Storm. That's the uh, game that I worked on together with as the producer. Uh, Jim and the On Target Simulations team made that game. I was their producer on that game. That's there behind me, along with Warren These Two, which I also worked on. Um, so as we take a look at uh, our research, if I look down here, you can see where I picked up the Tests of Merit, which has the Enigma Maze. It's not very far into the research tree here for the Kwame now. And I can still progress quite a lot farther there, but I've been focusing myself on getting better uh, planetary administration facilities. When I'm done with that, I think I'm going to be happy for a while. But you can see with the Kwame now, I'm not that far into the game, and I'm already pretty far into this particular tree. So if I chose to finish this entirely, which I will later on, um, that would count towards my victory conditions of completing an entire research tree. And you can also see here is the Transcendence Hub. But you can see the Transcendence Hub require it splits off from Superior Command, Advanced Research, Reality Replacement, and Genetic Rewiring. So you need to get, not quite finish all these trees, but get one short of finishing them to be able to then do Transcendence. Okay. Um, and yeah, thank you. I do think that with the Discovery Update, uh, and you know the things we've added in there that the galaxy feels the most alive yet. Uh, let's take a quick look at some of the other things that are a little bit unique to the Kwame no if we go up here. Uh, we have up here, you can see where their bubble shields come off. So we have right from the first early energy deflectors, you don't have to go down this tree. You can go up to their bubble shields and then later on they can merge back in here. They end with the impenetrable shields, but they can merge back in if you want the area shield recharge um, as part of that as well. And here are their Nova Core reactors, and if you look at the stats on those, those are really, really good reactors. Um, and they don't use, they're not that expensive resource-wise as well, but they have 1.667 fuel to energy, and they have 240 capacity and an output of 120. We can compare that, right? So here's the basic fission reactor. 62 output, 105 storage capacity, 1.9 fuel to energy, versus 120 output, 240 storage capacity, 1.667 fuel to energy. So this is an amazing reactor. This is their signature tech. Um, any plans of resurrecting the Ancient Guardians, Mad? I'm guessing you missed the beginning part of the stream. Um, in that we have reintroduced Ancient Guardian Vaults in the, in the Discovery Update, and they're also related to the um, Kwamino storyline. So if you play as the Kwamino, uh, you might even meet an Ancient Guardian. We'll see. Uh, yep. All right, so let's uh, speed things up a little bit. So I have been... I had found the debris field over here. And I'm getting messages suggesting that I should complete construction on some of the ships here. You can see here is one of my construction ships. I found these ancient abandoned, you know, damaged pirate ships over there. So we'll go ahead and queue another one of those for construction. They're offering to sell us an unknown system map. We don't want that right now. And the Hakanish uh, are stealing research information on fusion existential. Well, that's bad. They're trying to steal our Nova Core reactor, and in fact, they're succeeding. 
but we're not terribly good at espionage. This is the one thing. If someone really wants to, if you, if you are good at espionage and you start out near Kwame no Empire, uh, you are probably going to have a pretty enjoyable time getting some tech that way. No, we don't need to do that. We'll investigate threats there, sure. And I think that if we look at all these other issues here. Let's see. What do we have? That's in Mortalin space. I don't think we really need to worry about any of the rest of those unless we get into a war. Um, why have we disabled 8x speed again? We were finding some problems in the builds that we put 8x speed in on, and I don't think they were the fault of 8x speed per se, but we need to make some other improvements in the game, especially what I was talking earlier about um, how the memory usage can escalate. Uh, we need to fix or improve some of the things with that before I think we can reintroduce ADEX speed, but we will reintroduce it again as soon as we believe that it's safe to do so. Uh, you may have missed the start of the stream. Uh, I, I, I talked about all the things that are going to be the discovery update. Maybe I'll briefly... Okay, hang on, hang on. This is an important message. The Umwat Technocracy have sighted the Hive Swarm near Benarus 2 in the Benarus system. We should send our forces to investigate this grave threat. Well, the Umwat Technocracy are the Xenox. So the good news is that it's way over here somewhere. We don't, we don't even know where the Benarus system is yet. So the Hive, but the Hive's awake. That's the bad news. So we are going to have, you know, the possibility of the Hive at some point coming to pay us a visit. And I have already uh, set better beam weapons and better torpedoes to research. I think we will also uh, pick up some improved defense tactics so that we can get some planetary defense units. Because uh, those are great if people try to land on your planet and eat your people. You can shoot them down before they land. Um, and we can pick what else we might want to go down. Uh, I'll leave some of that up to you all. And I can also, if you prefer, we can go start a Gazurian game, but I'm a little further along in the Kwamino game, and I thought, in this particular build, and I thought we might just uh, play as the Kwamino for a while. Um, one thing you'll notice, the Kwamino with their Novacore reactors, do you see my fuel range here, that yellow circle around my fleet? You can see I'm not going to have any problem going over all the way from here across to my base over here, thanks to those Novacore reactors. No, I don't think we need to worry about that now. I think I might actually turn off the advice on this for now. Not technically bad advice, but we don't need to be uh, hearing all that right now. Oh, our mining station is being attacked. Buy some pirates. Okay, Kuminera security. So these guys are somewhere in this area. Do we know where they are? No, we, do, we clearly do not know where they are. There are a lot of pirates. I set this galaxy up to have many pirates to help me test a bit of the changes to make with them, but we... I do not see that we know Kuminera security yet. No, we do not. So let's make an effort with a spy. Uh, we have an uninhibited spy who's terrible at a lot of things, which probably makes him a bit expendable. So let's pick the... Uh, uh, where are they? Kuminer Security? And let's see if we can steal their territory map. We'll give him 12 months to try that. And we will try... Uh, PsyOps versus Sabotage. Let's try sabot the sabotage one. We'll, we'll send this one as well as a backup plan. And just see if one of them succeeds. Not a great success chance. Okay, we have completed repairs on this destroyer, which means we can now take charge of it. Very good. We've completed our regional government research. We dismissed an ambassador due to incompetence. Um, sure, we'll build some ships. Let's take also a look at what our 
do we, what do we have for ambassadors? Uh, they're, they're assigned to the Icaro Tranquility right now, so they're both boosting relations with that, which is probably a good thing uh, overall for us. So we're getting a plus 13% net diplomacy, and since we wanted to def befriend them, that's probably a good thing. We don't have the money to bribe them right now, but that will help when that when that happens. Reactor storage is the total energy that can be stored in a reactor at a given time. So um, there are certain things that need to consume uh, a whole bunch of energy at a time, and the reactor storage will need to be you know equal to or greater that than those to fully support those. It's also a question of, you know, converting fuel to energy, um, the rate at which you do that. And if you sort of exceed the, the rate of conversion, let me just mute myself for a sec while this is, while my phone is ringing here. Mic off. Mic on. Okay, that phone call's done. So, uh, well, the Clan of Superiority has cited the Hive Swarm in the Isuin system. So what I was saying is, you know, it, it basically gives you the ability to both absorb those big spikes in energy usage, which can happen typically in combat when you're firing all your weapons and all your shields are recharging and you're cranking up your engines to max speed. Um, and it can also give you a bit of a buffer, so if your rate of energy usage uh, is very high, you know, it, it, it won't use up what's in your reactor for a long time. So the Clan of Superiority was over here. That was who warned us, right? Yeah, the Clan of Superiority near Segezos. I don't see that we see Segezos yet. And by the way, one of the things we're aware of is people want a way to search for systems and planets. We are aware of that, and we have a plan, but it has not been finished yet. Okay, Talatan has been imprisoned. How's our other spy doing? Uh, I'm afraid that we have lost our two spies that we sent to get that pirate's territory map. And the Omwa technocracy has once again sighted them. So there's, I think there's some swarm ships here and some hive ships over here. Oh, and we dismissed that one, okay. So that did not go well for us, espionage-wise. We still don't know where the pirates are. And I'm afraid that... Uh, well, maybe we should send our last spy. What the heck? You never know. Third time might be the charm. Kuminer security. Steel territory map. Yeah, let's, let's go for the 12 months. 15% chance. I mean, three 15% chances we might get lucky eventually. So we've got over here uh, our space normalization fleet, which is based at the Oso 4 spaceport, and our defense fleet, our second defense fleet, which is also based at the Oso 4 spaceport. And I've set those both to basically 33% of fuel range. Um, and then we have our other one, which we assigned over to our fringe colony here. And that is now based there, and our spaceport there is completed, so that's good. Let's uh, tell them to just refuel. Uh, we haven't gotten enough fuel out there, so they'll go over to Cantrim, which is our closest place for them to refuel, and then they'll go back to stay around their home port. But if we keep them there without enough fuel, then they're not going to be very effective anyway. Um, well, we might take off the pirates. So if we take a look at the pirates, they are upset at our espionage missions, and they're upset at our attacks against their ships, which is pretty rich, of course, because they've been attacking our ships, and we've been defending ourselves. That's how pirates are. They don't really see it that way. Uh, let's see what we might have for Kazlon that we haven't yet mined. So if we take a look here, Liratur way over there, Mirkur here, Unalei 4. So the bad news is we don't have 
any additional sources of Kazlon that we can explore in this region, which is what I'd really like. Uh, if I look at our existing mining locations and I filter it down to just Kazlon, we can see, and this is why we had to go back to Cantrim, we have a Kazlon mining station here, here, and at these locations. So those are all our Kazlon mines are in these highlighted circles. So that's, we have a lot of them. We have a decent amount of Kazlon, we got 134k, but it's going to take some time for it to come out to here. You know, building the spaceport, building the colony over there helps, but still the amount of Kazlon you need to fully refuel a fleet is a pretty big amount. So over time, your civilian empire, uh, your civilian sector rather, will transport Kazlon to all your spaceports. Um, and they can then be effective fleet bases. In fact, what I can do, this will help, uh, is if I go back to here, I mean, I already set it to the planet, but let me set it to the spaceport too, just to encourage that I can say this is their home port. When I set the fleet's home port to a spaceport, then that will ramp up the Kazlon demand there. And you can see right now, it's telling the civilian economy that it wants 9,000 Kazlon there. So that's its maintain level. And currently it's got zero on hand. So what this is saying to the civilian economy is I want 9,000, I've got zero, so please send more. And over time, more will come. But for now, since I've wanted the fleet to refuel and be on station there, then the fleet has to go back to Cantrim, where there is Kazlon right now. And that's one of the other things. If you're playing uh, and you want, you know, a great deal of fuel efficiency, the Kwamino are a great faction to play for that, just because of how good those Nova Core reactors are. I'm going to go ahead and queue these up. I think what's going to happen here is that's going to help draw those pirates out too. And I think what I will also do is I'm going to take one of my defense fleets here. Actually, I take my space normalization fleet. And I think what we will do is we will tell them to go hang out here. Uh, that's probably a little bit of a spoiler again. But I have this planet here that has been fighting the pirates, but keeping them mostly away. So we've got a pirate destroyer, two pirate fleet destroyers attacking my poor small freighter, which is trying to get out of here, but has lost its shields and any armor it had. These pirate destroyers have railguns and lots of concussion missiles, so this one's probably uh, it's, it's pretty much disabled now, reactor after dive offline. It's gone back to hopefully be repaired by the spaceport if the spaceport survives this. The spaceport itself has ion cannons, concussion missiles, railguns, and a medium starfighter bay, but most of its fighters have been destroyed. It's just got one interceptor still active. That's what its design looks like. You can see here again that we're seeing the complete bonuses in one place. You know, whatever source they come from, we can see what effect they have on the hull now on the design screen and the ship details as part of the discovery update. This is not looking terribly good for us. And I'm going to guess that because I was so late in sending my fleet out here, uh, they are going to be taking a long time to get there. Yeah, you can see. Unfortunately, whatever my fleet can do, it's not going to come in time. So we're going to see what happens here. Maybe they'll raid it and not fully destroy it. They are raiding it now. Oh. Ah. Okay. So one of the uh, ships that I had repaired from that debris field nearby, one of the ancient pirate ships of mine was nearby, was not in the fleet, and was able to respond. And that tipped things to where the pirates decided to back off before this was actually destroyed. So that's nice. Should I retrofit this to one of my spaceports, or should I keep it as that? Um, I think I'll keep it as that for now. There's too many dangers in the area to start retrofitting now. And if we take a look here, you can also see that I was talking earlier about the Kwamina with their geneocracy. They cannot fund colony growth, so they're funding research at 100%, but my economy right now can't fully fund all my research. I have to expand and improve my economy, which is part of why I was looking at those 
various uh, government facilities. So we have government facilities that need to be upgraded. And I can't afford to upgrade them right now. So we will have to get back to that when I have a bit more money and then that will help. So they did succeed in raiding our base and they looted 6,700 credits, which will set us back a bit further economically, but that is the way of it with pirates. And unfortunately, you know, with pirates, that means that that will also enable them to build more ships and become more active over time. Uh, so we do need to find out about this Kuminer security in order to secure this portion of our frontier. I'm going to speed this up a bit. I know most folks like to play at faster speeds. Personally, I do prefer to play like 1x, 2x max, but I also know that for a live stream, it's, it's more exciting if I'm playing at 4x. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, okay, so we've completed that. That means we've done our two weapon upgrades now. So we have now our more advanced beams, the Thulon beam ver version two, and we have our more advanced Epsilon torpedoes. And we're researching our improved defense tactics now, and then we'll research the planetary defense units as part of that. And I don't want to do too much more there before I upgrade my economy. Uh, so let's take a look at what we can do for that. Well, first thing we can do is we can research medium freighters as part of enhanced civilian ships. That will give us a freighter type that's very well suited to those core resupply routes. So there are two different parts of the civilian economy. There are sort of these little on-demand supply runs, which are mostly assigned to the small freighters. And then there are the big supply runs that go between like the places that have a lot of stock and are just focused on sort of transferring between spaceports and planets and bring big bulk loads. The medium and large freighters tend to be better at those. And if you have those, then more of those tend to happen. So I'm going to go ahead and, and research those. Um, we could also go with, I mean, we've got the hive that is somewhere in our general region of the galaxy, but it's not close to us yet. So I don't feel compelled to do the destroyers yet, but maybe we could improve our frigates. And then looking at the economy some more, one thing that would help big time would be to do colonization, but I can't afford colonization, advanced colonization research just yet. Uh, we could do some mining research, perhaps. We could also improve our crew systems, uh, medical systems, recreation systems to increase our maintenance savings and increase these bonuses for our spaceports. And those are pretty cheap, so we can do that. Upgrade our transport systems a bit too. That should be enough for the moment. If any of you have any suggestions, you know, let us know. Adding the space slugs and giant Kaltors back. No, we have no plans for that. Um, the space slugs and the giant Kaltors were a thing in Distant Worlds 1. In Distant Worlds 2, um, those were effectively replaced by the Vorticar, which are Distant Worlds 2's uh, equivalent to the space slugs, I guess, and the Gravelux, which are Distant Worlds 2's equivalent of the Kaltor, and I think we're, I think those are honestly better than the old ones. Our colony, Quov, is under attack by the Mortalin network. Okay, so that's interesting. So raiders from the Mortalin network are attacking us there as well. So this goes back to, uh, the fact that our fleet was off refueling instead of defending Quov, and the Mordelin network, I'm guessing, is another pirate network. Oh, we do know theirs. We know where they live. They have a 2300 strength base. I think this will become our next focus, is to get a fleet over here and wipe out these guys since we actually know where they are. So let's do that, and then maybe once we, uh, once we finish that, we will uh, move along towards the end of the stream. If no one has any other questions about the Kwamino or the Gazurians uh, or the Discovery Update. Just getting through. Oh, that's a lovely research location. OK. 
Okay, so this again doesn't really concern me at all. The hive's been sighted, but you can see it's been sighted way over here. So that's good. The hive is getting further away from us right now, so we don't have an urgency with that just yet. Now, our fleet did finally arrive here. And this place has a fair amount of Kazlon, actually. So I think for the moment, I'm going to assign this as their home base. And uh, we'll have them hang out here. I'm actually going to, what I'm going to do to encourage them to do what I'm hoping they will do is I'm going to switch them to a defense fleet for now and have them deal with the Kuminur security and all their goings on in that particular area. And we have our other defense fleet going over there. So what I'm going to do is and take this defense fleet, which is an area of space that currently... Okay, and there's the hive up there. So I think there might be a couple of different hive swarms traveling around right now. Because I don't think they got from there to there that quickly. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one uh, and turn it into an attack fleet. Top it up a bit. And... Let's take a look at our attack fleet template. Now let's give it a few more frigates. Let's take, I think at this point, we'll take the escorts entirely out of those templates. I had them in at the beginning just to make sure, uh, but I don't think we need them in there right now. Whoops, that was a mistake. I do want frigates in there. So again, that'll just help me help define what goes in the fleet and what doesn't. Alright, and then we could top this up with some additional frigates. And that should hopefully get us to the point where it could compete with the Coulomb Outpost. It'll be a bit close though. Let's take a look at what it's using for these frigates right now. It does have the bubble shields. It does have my Mark II Thuon beams and Epsilon torpedoes. Uh, and I do have a countermeasure system. So that's decent. Uh, I better rename this to the... Get the escorts. So we've got again everything's up to date on those. Okay, so now what's the range on this? And you can see they, they have range. Now this they wouldn't normally attack that far away because of the fact that I'm telling this fleet, you know, to deal with things that are within 33% of its fuel range. That's clearly, although it has a good fuel range, that's clearly uh, well outside of that. Um, but we could manually order that. Can we see the Gazurian ships up close? Yeah, we absolutely can. Uh, well, first off, let me do let me do this while we're let me just get through a couple of these, and then I will take a look at those Gazurian ships with you for a sec. So, if you didn't see the Gazurian ships, let me show you this first. So, this is what the Gazurian ship set looks like. Uh, the discovery update will probably be something like version 1165 by the time it's done uh, and comes out on August 22nd, I'm guessing. Uh, I'm playing a, a not yet final version of it here today, but we're getting very close to finalizing it. Uh, so this is what the Gazurian chipset looks like and then I can also show you um, an illustration with their ships. And this is what they look like in game two. Obviously the illustration has a little bit of extra artistry added, but this is based on the in-game models, you know, just put into an illustration. So they tend to travel in big fleets because they're swarm targeting and um, they tend to have a lot of fighters and bombers and stuff like that. And this is, that's a Gazurian carrier in the middle, some cruisers on the sides and behind some destroyers and frigates and fighters and bombers. So that's that's the Gazurians for you.
and if you can look back later uh, in this you know when the stream is done I did do a sort of deep dive on the Gazurians and the Kwamino and all their uh, abilities and and how all that type of stuff works um, I think what I will do is I will base these guys over here. And how is the spaceport doing for Caslon? It's doing well. So I think what we will do. Fine. I agree to your trivial luxury resource request. I think what we will do is we'll tell them to, uh, they're going to refuel, and then we're going to tell them to move over there. Um, and then from here, we'll refuel again, and then we'll jump off to try to take out this pirate base, and that may allow us to see one of the new pirate cruisers that they now have defending their bases. Or they might have already built one, you know, that's already going around if they've been doing well enough. Commander Security have raided this mining station. So this is in a different system from this is a little bit farther away from our fleet here. So they're they're not hitting us so much here right now. We found another Kwamino Empire. They're not hitting so, us so much here right now as they are hitting us over on the fringes. Sure, so let's accept this. They like this enough that they want to offer treaties and we will now see alien distractions. Um, Minus 20% to all research. That was the cost of that. So if we look over here, we can see our alien distractions happening. I'm not going to be diving into much else treaty-wise. We have another hive sighting. No, they've made peace. It's telling us that they've made some peace with each other. Do we have new places to colonize? Let's see. We could colonize Tracetan way over there, but that's outside our colonization range. Same with Vonale. So the only other ones that we could colonize, we have another planet here that I like to look at things that are within five suitability of 20. So we could, for example, do these two, but only if we were gonna reasonably quickly research some improved colonization technology to bump those up to 20. Otherwise, it's going to cost us too much. And we have the money. We could potentially do that now. So if we did uh, marsh colonization, water colonization, let's see what other types of planets we have right now. Mangrove forests, desert savanna. Oh, and I have forgotten to do this, but we have Kwamino here. We should really just have them resettle. got humans, uh, deep ocean, mangrove forest. Yeah, so oceans and the swampy planets, that's what we want. So those are the two texts we queued. One of the other things we want to do soon is add more automation into the population policy so that I wouldn't have had to do that resettlement thing that I just did. Sure, we've got another advanced ancient ship on board. And we'll build another mining station there. No, we don't want protection with you. We're going to wipe you out. But they're getting worried. So it appears there are some threats here that are canceling the construction that I have been queuing. So let's take a look. It's probably that damn Kumineur security place again. Yeah, this has an amazing bonus. Not sure I didn't see any threat there, but that's usually what causes it, is that you queue it and then a threat discourages it and it gets canceled because of a threat in that location, which is usually pirates or, or space creatures. You want another treaty, you know, just because you're Kwamino. I will agree, and that has reset the timing. And this is, I get a chance to show you what I was talking about earlier, how in the discovery update now, when you have an empire-wide event, 
you get an icon for it up here that tells you the effects of the event and it tells you how long it lasts. So that now we can see, you know, when it's when that penalty for alien distractions is going to expire. Sure, let's build a base right next to the Mortalins. What could go wrong with that? Okay, hive swarm sighted in the Isabu system. Okay, so now that's getting interesting. Now they have a colony there. So we know they have a colony there. We can't see because we don't have any sensors or ships there, but we do have um, some of our traders periodically going into the area here by Abrigado Foss. So we sort of know the general area. So the hive is right around there. So there will be a point here where I think we have to start dealing with the hive. And here's the Kumino security again. Are these all Kumino security? They are. And this is an upgraded station now that has our best weapons? Yes, it does. So how far away from our fleet is this? This is the same place as before. But the, okay, these are disabled, so let me do this. Let me take my fleet and let's go over here and guard this for a bit since they think that's a safe place to raid now. Blood Claw Outlaws, no. But you know what? I wonder if we talk to some of these other pirate factions. Do we know any other pirate factions that were... All right, the Dread Rock Clan is over here. They might know where those guys are. Let's see. We negotiate a deal. They're willing to give us non-aggression, which is good, because that'll cost us less money. And they can only give us contact with another... Or we can give them contact with the Kwame Guild. Sure, let's do that. Well, let's get something from them. But they can't give us contact with those other pirates. They don't know where they are right now, at least such that they could tell us. Um, there's nothing we really want from them. Let's take an unknown system map for now. And would the Clan of Superiority also be willing to go to non-aggression? No, not quite yet. They don't like us enough for that. Aha, uh -huh, but they have a lot of empires and independence that they know about, but they're in the other direction, so they're probably not going to know the Kuminer security guys. And I think we're out of spies now, yes. Unfortunately, all our spies were captured by the Kuminer security. Apparently, they are actually quite secure. Let's see. Um... Will you consider making super weapons that can shoot between systems and bombard planets exclusive only for evil factions? Shoot between systems? Uh, I can't say we've considered that. Um, I'd be curious to know why, like how that would work. Uh, what would be the, if you make a super weapon that could shoot between systems, what would you be shooting it at? How would you counter it? Um, the Bombarding planets exclusive only for evil factions. No, we, we don't make bombarding exclusive for evil factions, but the uh, combination of your chosen races, aggression, and sort of your government factors on aggression and war weariness also significantly influence um, how much you care about how negative your reputation is. So if you bombard a place, you will get a penalty to your reputation, okay? And if you are a peace-loving, uh, you know, democracy that doesn't really want to bombard people, then your people will actually really care that you've gone and bombarded these people and that your reputation is now very negative. But if you're a ruthless military dictatorship, they won't really care. So it won't cause you a significant penalty compared to a peace-loving democracy. At the same time, if you're having diplomacy with other military dictatorships that are equally ruthless, they also won't care that your reputation is so negative, but if you're a military dictatorship that's been bombarding the heck out of planets, then you go try to have diplomacy with a peaceful democracy, they'll look at you in horror and say, you know, we, we can't. You know, you've been bombing people to smithereens, and we're not, a, we're not cool with that. So we already have that sort of uh, significant weighting of the reputation effects. So something keeps aborting that. I should actually watch that for a while to figure out, see if I can figure out what's going on. But we have this sort of weighting with the reputation system that already ends up... Um, creating a much more mitigating effect so that if you're playing a faction that really is kind of evil, like a Biscara, 
uh, you know, hive mind or something that just is totally fine, or even the gazarians for that matter, that is just totally fine with exterminating what's in your way, um, that it's really not going to be something that goes against your play style. So these guys moved another system over. So let's see if we can meet them there. So the Mordelin pirates that we're going to attack are attacking us over there. And the hive is still hanging around there. It's good that the hive hasn't come visiting yet. It's over towards Mordelin space. Sure. Call me no like to have uh, like to have some R and R as well from time to time. Probably they go to these resort bases and just do puzzles all day. Uh, Sudoku Palace or something like that. So let's see how's this fleet doing here. Retrofitting now because we just got the improved uh, frigate hulls. Yep. So we're gonna gonna get improved frigates now. And when they're done retrofitting, we are going to launch our attack, and I think that is where, once that attack finishes, unless the hive shows up, then we'll play a little longer. But once that attack finishes, I think we will end the stream. I'm going to see if I can figure out what's going on at Merkur. Alright, so we have, we have queued a research station to build there. Which means one of these ships should end up assigned to it. Yep. Let's see if we can see what happens. What is this ship here? This is the Ikura Tranquility hanging out there. Ah, hang on. Is this in? I just saw a flash like there's a... Does this have a system storm? see a system storm, but I thought I saw a flash as if there was a storm there. Yeah, actually there are a couple of extra diplomacy events that happen with the Hive. Um, first off, the pirates who are normally, you know, not your best friends. Uh, when the Hive shows up, they get highly motivated uh, to cooperate against the Hive. And if you help them enough, they'll even join you, like the entire pirate faction will join you. Uh, and the second thing that happens is empires that are getting attacked by the hive that know you will often reach out to ask for help against the hive. And uh, what you'll see here is the Umwat technocracy already reached out and asked me for that and I didn't help. So now they have a minus 10 permanent here against me that we refused to help them when the hive came. You know, it's just too out of the way. <laughs> but yeah, those things definitely happen. Uh, the Kwamino Guild have now cited them. And the Mordelin territory has eliminated the Blood Claw outlaws, so the Mordelin are getting in on the action of fighting against pirates a bit. And I was going to check to see what's happening here with Merkur. So we have a co construction ship queued to actually build that particular place. Usil Spirit is building that particular place. So let's take a look at Usil Spirit. It's in hyperspace right now on its way there. Typically, if you agree that you will help them, they will um, uh, give you some... Uh-oh, now they're really mad and declared war on us. We didn't help them against the hive, so they thought they'll punish us for that. If you... Uh, help them, they'll typically give you, like the pirates will give you a military refueling treaty, the uh, other empires will usually give you again a territory map and a military refueling treaty and you'll be expected to actually send some ships to help, um, you know, send a fleet of some kind to help fight the fight against the hive.
All right, so the construction ship is going there, so we'll wait a bit, but uh, let's see if our other fleet is ready to go. It is, so let's go and attack this pirate base. Um, these are the other pirates on the other side who have been attacking us. Oop, it's not there. Is it over here? Yeah, that's them. All right, so we will go ahead and attack them. Poor Xenox, they're in a really bad mood. They've got the hive, and they decided to fight us. Now I will say, the Xenox probably can reach us at this point, so it's not so good. And this, this fleet hasn't done an awful lot of good for us, in terms of, uh, they tell us about an attack against our colony. The attackers were a strange race of hybrid insectoids, attacked with a crazed, merciless rage, consuming everything in their path. The Xenox will be in terror that these vicious monsters may return. So that's the hive. That's the hive. And then we have pirates raiding our colony over there. Now, I do have a fleet here, too. Looks like my fleet was fighting the pirates. I'm going on times four speed. So one of the things that happens on times four speed is a lot of stuff happens. Um, well, then they don't... Oh, what happens if you d accept help and do not send any ships? Then they're going to be disappointed in you. Um, but what happens uh, when you're running at times for speed is you also miss a lot. You know, stuff will happen and you don't get to look at it in time. So that's what happened there. We had a little skirmish. They still got to raid the planet, but I'm pretty sure my fleet would have caused some damage to them. Uh, now, we've still got the Kuminer security guys over here. But we have not had, see they're raiding way over there now, we have not had any significant engagement. So I'm going to take these guys, I'm going to rebase them, because the Xenox are at war with you, I'm going to rebase them back in my home system. Just so that I don't, so that I'm not without a fleet in my home system. So we'll set the home base here, and we'll say to refuel there. And we'll go ahead and, oh, I did that wrong, that's a resort base. <laughs> I was wondering why it was called that. Let's change this one more time. Set them to the spaceport. Uh, destroying hive ships. Do they acknowledge if you destroy hive ships? So if you destroy hive ships, um, you will get a reputation bonus and a relationship bonus with the empires and pirates who both like you destroying the hive. But it's not particularly easy to destroy the hive. Um, can I tell a few suggestions from Discord you are working on implementing? My best suggestion if you want to know what we're working on implementing is to take a look on our forum or the Steam forum or the Discord where we've posted our latest roadmap of what we are working towards. Um, I went over at the start of this stream a lot of the improvements that we've just put into the discovery update, which are, again, about 15 pages worth. Um, but when it comes to, oops, I think I'm moving too fast and talking too much, so our fleet has just about arrived here. So we're gonna watch this battle happen. But when it comes to what we're working on the future, the roadmap gives you a pretty good idea. Um, if you have a specific uh, suggestion that you're curious about, you can ask me here, and I'll try to answer if I can. Uh, yeah, the Gazurians, I mean, again, I don't want to spoil a lot here, but the Gazurian storyline is connected with the Hive. So the Gazurians have more opportunities than other factions to, to deal with the Hive uh, in different ways, and also to encounter more of the Hive. Just like the Kwamino have more options in their storyline to deal with the Ancient Guardians and their vaults. So we've got this big outpost here, and we've got our fleet coming in. We have taken some punishment. This ship was disabled, but it looks like we wiped out about half of their fighters. I'm going to stop talking a bit while this attack unfolds. See our ships firing their torpedoes. We can 
can see the base firing back at us. So some of those area weapons, when you see those explosions, that's an area weapon exploding. You can see the little fighters here. We're also firing at our ships. That was the autosave. <laughs> now we're unleashing all of our beam weapons. We're in close enough range. We've gotten through the shields, we're taking out the armor. We're gonna win this one, but you can see our ships have taken a decent amount of damage too. And here, I'm gonna pause it here. So here, for those of you who have not seen it, is the new pirate cruiser. So you can see these pirate assault bombers that appear to have just launched from the pirate cruiser. It has come in to help its base. So you can see this is what a pirate cruiser looks like. It's a bit shark-like, I would say. Whoops. What did I just do? I misclicked. So we can watch what the pirate cruiser does. What does it have here? It has, um, has a lot of stuff, actually going on so let's see let's see how it does I think we're in pretty good shape though because we've already gotten the base badly damaged but let's see what happens here yeah I'm afraid it showed up just a bit too late all those beam weapons has eliminated us. Six of their ships joined our empire. Guess what? The pirate cruiser decided to join our empire after that. So we now have an actual pirate cruiser, which is our first cruiser. So that's kind of exciting. And the mortal and network have been destroyed, so they will no longer be a menace to that particular part of the uh, of our borders. So that worked rather well. I'm going to take my fleet here and uh, I'm going to tell them to go back and retrofit at a spaceport. They've got a lot of repairs to do. Okay, and of course I wasn't watching, so somehow the construction there was aborted. Normally I'd be playing a little bit slower and I would just would have watched to see what was canceling the construction on that in the end. But I did not because we were watching the pirate spaceport. All right, so I've reviewed the Kwame No, I've reviewed uh, the Pirates, I've reviewed the Discovery Update, talked about the Hive. We haven't seen the Hive yet, but I'll go into uh, cheat mode again. Ah, in terms of population policy, yeah, that's pretty high up on our priority list, is to add some better automation to population policy so that it creates less micromanagement for the player. That is That is quite high up on our list, along with some AI improvements for how it handles its economy and some other UI improvements to make life easier on the player. I just wanted to see if I could see where the hive was. This is this cheat mode lets me sort of look around at everything that's going on in the galaxy. I don't see the hive around here right now. The hive appears to be here, so let me do this. Since we're in cheat mode, let's just take a quick look here. So we have here a hive frigate. It's one of the new hive frigates that we see here. And there are a few other hive ships here. So we have another frigate. Let's see if we can find a destroyer. Yeah, so here's a hive destroyer over there. And it looked like maybe there were some more hive ships over here by the star. Yeah, there's a carrier. Okay, there's the big hive carrier. So this is a hive fleet. It's actually got two carriers, and you see a bunch of these auxiliary ships. So it's acting as a fleet. And that one is currently going off in this direction. We don't know why. Uh, it seems like it's raiding a mining station still, so they're still focusing on pirates and, and bases. Eventually they'll come for your planets, but fortunately they are still quite far away from us. The empires in the middle of the galaxy have to deal with them right now. Um... All right, so I think I've shown you all uh, a bit of a preview of everything. 
Uh, so I think this is a good point for us to call the stream to a close. Um, again, I hope you all will take a look back. If there was information you were looking at, we went through the discovery update in detail at the beginning of the stream. We then went through the Kwame no Nagazurians in detail a little bit later on, and then we've been doing some playing around with the Kwame no since then. If you go back to the recording of the stream at the beginning, you'll get all that other information. Um, and there's also going to be, obviously, there are, there are store pages for the DLC upcoming, and we're going to have a full change list out for the update when that releases. The update is coming out on August 22nd. The new DLC for Kwame no Gazurians is coming out on September 7th. And the update adds a lot of new content to the base game, too, whether you have the DLC or not. So take a look. Thank you very much for all of your interest um, and for just supporting us uh, and everything that we've done here with Distant Worlds 2 and we will absolutely keep going and keep making Distant Worlds as, as great as we can. Thank you very much everyone and I will be signing off now. So happy gaming, uh, be well, um, all good things to all of you. Take care. Bye bye.